So as a Utica College professor, one of the things that I'm always concerned about is the fact that my students aren't really aware of the resources that the city of Utica has to offer them. And it kind of became clear to me that not, not only were they not aware of the resources, they, but they also weren't thinking about Utica as a city or as a place, as something to potentially be discovered. And they weren't thinking about the ways in which being more aware could actually benefit their experience at Utica College. I worked with seniors who didn't know something like the Tramontane Cafe was right down the street from them, a place where they could hear live music, see theater, have non-alcoholic beverages, have a positive community interaction. And it worried me. I worried that as educators, we weren't really doing our job of pushing our young people into the community and asking them to connect to the community in a way that not only made sense to them, but also benefited them. So I designed an English composition course around this idea of wandering as a means to sort of create community and think about community and sort of connect. So on the first day of class, I asked my students to come in and tell me what they'd heard about Utica or what they knew about it. And we threw all these phrases on the board. Uh, so I heard abandoned, economically depressed, gray, cold, crime, the projects. Uh, and then eventually we started hearing tomato pie, chicken riggies, Utica greens, uh, Italian American. So I sort of slumped out of the classroom. Uh, there seemed to be a lot of food pride, but not a lot of place pride. Um, but that's a good start. But it seemed that students who were from Utica really couldn't articulate what they liked about it, and students that weren't from Utica hadn't heard good things. So I really wanted to create something where my students had to think about process. Uh, in this culture, current American culture, we're all about eliminating processes. We think that it makes us more efficient. And I'm not necessarily against that idea, but I think there's a problem with it. And the biggest problem is that we're inventive through process, we're creative through process, and we actually learn through process. Uh, so by eliminating some of these processes, we're eliminating our creativity, our learning ability, and sometimes our inventiveness. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that process was part of this. And wandering is one such creative process that's going away, literally walking around one city, uh, partially aimlessly. Uh, so I, it's something that writer, writer Rebecca Solnit talked about, and she says that wandering actually connects or creates a story or a constellation between the stars of our minds, our bodies, and our environment. Uh, and she said it facilitates community, health, and well-being in a way that's very unique. So getting rid of wandering is kind of a problem. I also wanted to make sure that my students were clear about curiosity. In our main culture right now, you can Google something, you're no longer curious about it. Your curiosity lasts about five seconds. Uh, luckily for me, Utica is not very Googleable. So I knew that by asking my students to go into the community and go, uh, they couldn't Google Utica. It had to be something, it was something that had to be experienced. So if you just look at the word pedestrian, there's also this idea about walking not being valued in our culture anymore either, right? We think it's boring. We think it's something that we wouldn't want to do. We decided it's a synonym for dull. So I wanted to make sure that walking was something that was also involved in this process of learning. Walking has long been a metaphor for thinking and writing. Uh, you take one step, it's equal to one word, one thought. Uh, you take another step, it's equal to a journey or a sentence that leads to a story, or possibly you're on some kind of uh, thought processes that lead to an idea. We've long had this idea that walking helps us think, and only recently did we decide that scientists should be involved and possibly to study this anecdotal idea. So Stanford University actually did research recently where they discovered that walking did help us think creatively. 100% uh, of people who walked were able to come up with answers to questions more effectively than those that sat down. And it's not just science that knows that walking is important. In the history of literature, we've had this figure of the wanderer. And of course, one of the original wanderers is Cain. Uh, from Cain and Abel. And writer Rebecca Solnit says, of course, Cain is doomed to wander the earth uh, rootlessly. He's sort of criminal. And it's no accident that his children become the creators of the first cities in the world. Uh, so the city is, by its very nature, a rootless, wandering sort of creation. And 
Of course, we also have this idea sort of rising up in the 1830s uh, when cities are becoming incomprehensible. You can no longer stand in one spot and see the entire city. Uh, there's sort of an urban landscape that's giant and overwhelming. So we have no longer a space that's full of your neighbors and your friends that you can talk to, but suddenly the city is a place that's full of strangers and people you're standing next to that you'll never know. And so we get the rise of this literary figure called the Wanderer, or the Flinner. And this is made most famous by Edgar Allan Poe's short story, A Man in the Crowd. And it was translated in 1840 by Charles Baudelaire into French, and the Parisians just loved this story. At the beginning of the short story, you have this moment, or this quote, where it says, some books do not allow or permit themselves to be read. And when you're reading the story, you suddenly realize he's not talking about books, he's talking about people because our main character is wandering through a city street and he's actually reading the bodies and the faces of all the people around him. Uh, and this is a way that he's surviving. It's survival in the city to suddenly sort of feel like you can read people on the street. And he encounters a man who he actually can't read and he discovers that this person is also a reader of people and he suspects he might be a criminal, so he follows him. Um, but the Flender is sort of a creation uh, in literature to push back on these urban spaces, someone who feels more comfortable in a crowd than by themselves at home or in a domestic space. Currently in literature, Teju Cole uh, recently wrote a book called Open City. Our Flaneur characters are still evolving. Uh, they're no longer just sort of criminal, rootless people wandering around who are reading faces, uh, but they're a little bit more philosophical. So not just literature, but also art has talked about wandering and walking specifically. So in the early 20th, early 20th century, we had art going away from the idea of an object. Uh, Dada artists wanted to make sure that art was no longer considered an object and that we looked at our environments as conduits uh, for pieces of art. So of course, walking naturally became this idea. And performance artists today are still using walking heavily in their performance art as part of this process. So there are tons of writer manifestos that sort of came out of this period of, of art and this idea of walking as art. So here's a couple of the ideas. So walker as artist, your legs are your paintbrush, and your city is your canvas, and you sort of move through the city and you paint as you walk. Uh, there's walker as writer of the city, so anywhere you walk inside your city, there's a story there. And as you walk, you're connecting all these histories, these these memories, these ideas, and you're actually creating your own new story in all the spaces that you're going through. And the idea of walker as performer, uh, making strange of the everyday, having an experience where you're walking and you're also sort of walking maybe in a new way, in a different way, in a funny way, or possibly in a way, uh, or in a place that isn't meant for walking, so experimental walking. Now, I know this all sounds great, all these philosophies and all these ideas and manifestos, what does that have to do with Utica? How do we make it work here? Well, one of the things I noticed when I first moved here was that we actually have a lot of sidewalks and there actually aren't that many people on them. Uh, so I thought Utica could benefit from the idea that walking is uh, cost-free. It's a way to have an experience and it's something that could facilitate your health and your community. You're actually out and about. So, uh, in September, we had a couple of young men who were arrested for parkouring on top of a Walmart. Uh, and while I'm sorry that these two young men were arrested, I, I must say they're already doing what, I, what I've suggested. They're finding Utica beautiful, they're seeing the top of a Walmart as a potential site for art, and they're using creative body movement through the space of Utica to say something, to express something. Uh, so, it's already happening. <laughs> All right, so fast forwarding to my students' projects five weeks in, I'm on the phone for a good bit of a Wednesday afternoon with Utica police. They're like, we've never seen so many young people walking around. They're taking pictures. They're being really polite, but we don't understand what's happening. <laughs> And I had a similar conversation with someone who's a security guard at Old Main where a bunch of my students decided to do their research projects. Oh my gosh, there's an overwhelming amount of young people in groups. What are they doing here? They told me to call you, you're responsible. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Uh, the Oneida Historical Society also uh, contacted us in a similar fashion, saying that they were actually overjoyed, that they had never seen so many young people storming the place asking for, asking for information about the history of Utica. Um, and I was so happy for my students. My heart grew th three sizes. You know, they were walking around and they were asking questions and they were freaking people out. Um, but in a way that really created a facilitated community. The community was responding positively. Uh, they weren't sure what was going on at first, but they responded positively. Um, and my students came back to the classroom and they reported about all the things that they saw. So a couple of my students ended up at the Utica train station where they talked to the barber, Leo. And Leo told them tons of stories, uh, including about how the horse-drawn carriages brought in the marble for the pillars at the train station. He also told them about you know, the moment in, in time when Utica was thinking about demolishing the train station. And he spoke really passionately about how he didn't believe that that should have ever happened, that that should have even been a question. Um, he told a story about two young men who sat in those two barber chairs and got their hair cut and said goodbye to one another for the last time right before they were shipped off to war. Uh, so a really powerful experience at the train station. I also had students who were researching Forest Hill Cemetery and they weren't very enthusiastic about it. They were like, oh, cemetery. Uh, until they met Gerard Waterman, the, super, the superintendent there, and he drove them around in his truck and gave them a personalized tour of Forest Hill Cemetery. And he explained to them the beauty of the headstones and how it described the prominence of the families that were buried there and how the wandering Victorian style paths are supposed to mimic the wanderings of life. And they came back super excited and they found so much beauty in the cemetery and they, they were excited to talk about it. So in August, I got an email from a former student who was really excited that they decided to open up Old Main for a tour. And she had done her project on this thing about six months ago, but she was still thinking about it, still wanting to visit this place, still feeling connected to this place, so much that she wanted a whole group of students to go with her, she wanted me to come, she wanted to make it an event. So through this project, students are going out into the community, asking questions, finding out about things, becoming experts on their own spaces that they then felt comfortable going back to. I was happy that students were experiencing Utica. I read recently that objects cannot and do not and will not make you happy, but that experiences can and do and will. Uh, what is the easiest way to have an experience? Walk out your front door. So, if you would like to practice wandering, either in Utica or other places, uh, one of the things I recommend is not to have music playing. And the reason is, is you're supposed to walk at your natural pace so you can think at your natural rhythm. Uh, music will affect the rhythm of your walk, which also affects the rhythm of your natural thinking patterns. The other thing you want to make sure is that you take unexpected turns. Don't just walk in the same paths. Uh, surprise yourself. Go somewhere different. And maybe even don't have a particular destination. Just end up somewhere. It would be great. Um, you also want to make sure that you allow your mind to wander. You know, creativity is not a focused thing. It's not a straight line. So if your body is wandering, allow your mind to sort of clear and wander. And of course, you want to make sure you're actively noticing things. It's your community. Don't just see the flower. See the Coke can that's lying next to it. What does it make you think about? What does it make you feel? So, Walking or wandering creates this story or constellation between our minds, our bodies, and our environments. So in order to make sure that this path is worn, we have to keep walking the path. Keep walking, keep wandering. So I challenge you, wander Utica. Walk around, notice, deviate, explore, reclaim your urban space, reclaim Utica.